healing of a baby's chin if not made by the baby itself. It recalls Baraka's comment on hearing a John Coltrane solo that consisted of playing the head of confirmation again and again, 20 times or so, like watching a grown man learning to speak. In both cases, as with the Dogon trumpet burst and its put and its part in Song of Andy and Bulu 58, and as it's put in Song of the Andum Bulu 58, one is back at some beginning, some extremity, taking one back to animating constraint. The antelope horn, trumpets blast and bleat, Cherry's ludic warble and Train's recursive quandary are variations on music as Gnostic announcement, ancient rhyme, that of end and beginning, Gnostic accent or note that cuts both ways. But not only music, Mu, in quotes to underscore its what saidness, is also lingual and imaginal effect and affect, myth and mouth in the Greek form muthos that Jane Harrison, as Charles Olson was fond of noting, calls a reutterance or preutterance, a focus of emotion, surmising the first muthos to have been simply the interjectional utterance mu. Mu is also lingual and erotic allure, mouth and muse. Mouth, not only noun, but verb. And muse, likewise, lingual and imaginal process, prod and process. It promises verbal and romantic enhancement, graduation to an altered state, momentary thrall translated into myth. Proffered from time immemorial, poetry's processional boon, it thrives on quixotic persistence, the increment or enablement language affords promise and impossibility rolled into one. Mu carries a theme of utopic reverie, a theme of lost ground and an elegiac allure recalling the Atlantis-like continent Mu. Though by some, thought by some during the late 19th century and early 20th century to have existed long ago in the Pacific. The places named in the Song of the Andumbulu set foot on by the deceased while alive but lost or taken away by death could be called Mu. Any longingly imagined, mourned, or remembered place, time, state, or condition can be called Mu. Now, I wanted us to try to think about the relation between Professor Mackey's and Professor Wilderson's dialectic of held fantasy. Professor Wilderson's register is more explicitly and emphatically philosophical, and so our registers might have to shift as well. Entrance into the philosophy of the subject is also perilous, but it seems as if our belatedness makes such peril necessary if the goal is to approach the ship and its hold. And this is Professor Wilderson from Red, White, and Black. To put it bluntly, the imaginative labor of cinema, political action, and cultural studies are all afflicted with the same theoretical aphasia. They are speechless in the face of gratuitous violence. This theoretical aphasia is symptomatic of a debilitated ensemble of questions regarding political ontology. At its heart are two registers of imaginative labor. The first register is that of description, the rhetorical labor aimed at explaining the way relations of power are named, categorized, and explored. The second register can be characterized as prescription, the rhetorical labor predicated on the notion that everyone can be emancipated through some form of discursive or symbolic intervention. But emancipation through some form of discursive or symbolic intervention is wanting in the face of a subject position that is not a subject position. What Marx calls a speaking implement or what Ronald Judy calls an interdiction against subjectivity. In other words, the black has sentient capacity but no relational capacity as an accumulated and fungible object rather than an exploited and alienated subject. The black is openly vulnerable to the whims of the world and so is his or her cultural production. What does it mean? What are the stakes when the world can whimsically transpose one's cultural gestures, the stuff of symbolic intervention, onto another worldly good, a commodity of style? Fanon echoes this question when he writes, I came into the world imbued with the will to find a meaning in things, my spirit filled with the desire to attain to the source of the world, and then I found that I was an object in the midst of other objects. He clarifies this assertion and alerts us to the stakes 
which the optimistic assumptions of film studies and cultural studies, the counter-hegemonic promise of alternative cinema, and the emancipatory project of coalition politics cannot account for when he writes, ontology, once it is finally admitted as leaving existence by the wayside, does not permit us to understand the being of the black. A certain kind of sociological desire is announced in this utterance. An echo, not only of Fanon, not only of Orlando Patterson, but of an anticipatory counter utterance in Du Bois as well. What is our methodological comportment in the face of the question concerning the strange meaning of being black when the ontological attitude is already under a kind of interdiction with regard to such being? A sociology of relations that would somehow account for the radically non-relational, but this only insofar as relationality is understood to be an expression of power, structured by the givenness of a transcendental subjectivity which the black cannot have, but by which the black can be had. A structural position that he cannot take, but by which he can be taken. The givenness and substantiveness of transcendental subjectivity is assured by a relative nothingness. They remain unquestioned in brutal antisocial support of one another. To speak of the unbridgeable gap between black being and human life is still an attempt to index black existence by way of ontological means. And even if the ontology in question is a political one, it backs away from the experimental declivity that de Fanon and Du Bois were at least able to blaze, each in their own way forging a sociological path that would move against the limiting force held in the ontological traces of positivism on the one hand and phenomenology on the other, as each would serve as the foundation of a theory of relations posing the nothingness of blackness in its negative relation to the substance of subjectivity as non-blackness. In this regard, blackness remains subject to ontology's sanction against the very idea of black subjectivity. The paraontological distinction between blackness and blacks is important here, not only because it allows us no longer to be enthralled by the notion that blackness is a property that belongs to blacks, but also because ultimately it allows us to detach blackness from the question of the meaning of being. The difference between pessimism and optimism lies not in the disbelief or belief in descriptions of power relations or emancipatory projects. The difference is given in the space between an assertion of the relative nothingness of blackness or black people in the face, literally, of substantive white or non-black subjectivity and an inhabitation of absolute nothingness, absolute appositionality, its internal social relations, which remain unstructured by the protocols of subjectivity insofar as mu, absolute nothingness, is most emphatically marked in Glissant's phrase, consent not to be a single being. At stake is a certain black capacity not to desire sovereignty not to desire ontological relationality, whether it is recast in the terms and forms of a Levinasian ethics or an Arendtian politics, both of which assume and demand sovereignty. For Wilderson, what distinguishes the sovereign, the sledder, the settler, and even the savage from the slave is that they share, quote, a capacity for time and space coherence. At every scale, the soul, the body, the group, the land, and the universe they can both practice cartography and, although at every scale their maps are radically incompatible, their respective mapness is never in question. This capacity for cartographic coherence is the thing itself, that which secures subjectivity both for the settler and the savage, and articulates them to one another in a network of connections, transfers, and displacements. And so, of course, one must become interested in things in a certain relationship between thingliness and nothingness and blackness that plays itself out in unmapped, unmappable, under common sociality. While Nishido Kataro, Nishida Kataro claims that being is thought of in terms of the objectivity of determinate things, a thought, he says, that leads to nihilism and relative nothingness, I would want to think through, by way of Fanon's negation of this condition, how blackness is the site where absolute nothingness in the world of things converge. What Nishida calls the place of absolute nothingness is the hole, where Cherry and Blackwell touch an intimacy from the walls. 
The whole sovereign expression and recuperation is broken down. Feel the complete lyrics of this morbid universe. Flesh, touch, is not where subjectivity and objectivity come together in some kind of self-determining dialectical reality. Beyond that, in the hold, in the basho, is the social life of things. Blackness is fantasy in the hold, and Wilderson's access to it is in the knowledge that he can have nothing, and in the capacity to desire and not to desire, of which this knowledge is an index. It remains for us to structure an accurate sense of what nothing actually is and what it constitutes in the exhaustion of home, intersubjectivity, and what Professor Sexton calls ontological reach. The truth of the formulation that the black cannot be among or in relation to his own is given in terminological failure. What's at stake is how to improvise the declension from among his own to the unmappable zone of paraontological consent. The promise of another world, or the end of this one, is given in the general critique of world. 